Welcome to everyone who signed in today to join us for this exciting panel on uh, pumped hydropower from coastal areas and shallow seas, such as off the coast of the Netherlands, as we will uh, learn about today with the Alpheus project. Um, oftentimes, we think of renewables as the wind farms, the offshore, the solar power, the PV that dominate the visualization of what the energy transition is today in our times. However, there are exciting technologies out there that um, are, are less visible, let's say, to the eye or to, um, or to the public at first glance, but that have solutions as well for, for, for being uh, you know, contributors to greater sustainability. So today we have um, five speakers with us. We have Niels Goseberg, who's professor of coastal and ocean engineering at the Technique Universitat Braunschweig. We have Jeremy Bricker uh, signing in from the United States. Thank you for joining us today. He's PhD, PE, and Jeremy is associate professor of civil hydraulic engineering at TU Delft and the University of Michigan and he functions as the scientific coordinator of the Alpheus uh, project. We also have Anne Overmed, who's director of Blau Cluster in, um, I wanna say the Netherlands, but it may overlap with Belgium. We will learn about that uh, today. Um, Blau Cluster is a network of innovative organizations advancing the blue economy. Um, we have Dr. Peter Hoffman, who is Director of Energy System Planning at Tenet. Tenet is, a, is the Dutch transmission system operator. Um, he's been in that position of director since July 2020. And lastly, but not least, we have Madame Bettina Geisler, who is the owner and head of Geisler Law. Um, very brief uh, housekeeping for those of you who have questions or comments, please drop them in the Q&A uh, and we'll be uh, monitoring that and trying to uh, feed in your questions throughout the course of, of today's panel. Um, so don't be shy, the attendees who are, who are watching and who are online with us today, feel free to to pipe up and, and ask your questions and we'll try to integrate them as I said. So um, Niels, the, the floor is yours please for a uh, introduction to Alpheus. Great, thank you, Stuart. Uh, it's a great pleasure for me to, on behalf of the consortium of the Alpheus uh, project, uh, to introduce the Alpheus um, and its activities in, in this uh, today's uh, webinar. And I would uh, like to directly uh, jump into my a couple slides that I have. And first of all, introduce Alpheus as a project that is funded by the European Union's Horizon 2020 program. Uh, it's a 5 million grant uh, for a consortium of companies and various universities in the European Union and is led by and coordinated by the TU Delft in the Netherlands. The purpose of our project is, in fact, to improve reversible pump and turbine technology and its adjacent civil structures needed to make pumped hydro storage economically viable in shallow seas. And you will very soon see uh, how it differentiates from uh, the conventional technology that we have so far. But before I show more about the technology we are developing, a brief slide on the project partners. You see the map and um, the, see where all the different partners are located from Norway in the far north uh, up to Italy and France, um, covering a wide spread of different disciplines, making it a truly multidisciplinary project that is needed to achieve the goals of the project. The benefits of Alpheus to the hydropower community, and why is that relevant? So far, pumped hydro energy storage uh, is a very mature and environmentally friendly method of large scale energy storage. However, it is so far only really practical in large topographic differences, and that most of the time means mountains, so high elevation differences. 
And the challenge that we are addressing as Altheus Consortium is, and that we strive to, is to make pumped hydro energy storage practical as well for low eleva elevation countries. And the guiding principle is in this uh, little sketches here, uh, consider in, for example, the, the North Sea, consider a ring dam with an inner reservoir, uh, a ring uh, dike around and the open sea um, surrounding it. And now we have two different stages in case there is enough energy, so an excess of energy, we are uh, evacuating the inner reservoir pumping out uh, water for times when the grid needs more electric energy. And that is the turbining stage in which we let the, uh, the reservoir fill with the, the, with the water of the North Sea um, running through turbines and generating electricity uh, for the grid. And in order to make that happen and make it um, technically, but also economically feasible. There are a couple of things that we need to address and a couple of ranges of operation stages that we are addressing. First of all, we want to make hydropower and storage system that is in a range of two to 20 meters head height. So the difference between outside and inside of this um, ring dike. We also want to make sure that we can change between pumping and turbining within one minute, being flexible to serve the grid and to make sure it remains stable. And last but not least, we want to make sure that we get a trip efficiency of larger than 70% while also minimizing the environmental impact. We will achieve that through a couple of different work packages. And today I have brought five of them to explain what the activities in the work packages are. First of all, we have designed counter-rotating and positive displacement pump turbine machine sets, um, both at full scale and at model scale, so scaled down. And we have done that such that we can optimize the round trip efficiency, work on the mode switching times and uh, reduce fish mortality. And in the figures, and, and pictures, you see some of the technical aspects that are relevant to it. Next, how do we get from the uh, rotating motion? How do we get electricity or bring the electricity to the rotation for the pumping? Um, it needs a power takeoff design and that was dry tested. And you see a couple of um, images of that um, power takeoff that is being designed and built at high efficiency and most importantly, it's supposed to operate over a wide range of conditions from 20% of the nominal torque up to the full torque that it is designed for. Third, um, there is a work package on laboratory validation. So we are not just designing and building something, throwing it into the, into the North Sea. First of all, it's needed to be demonstrated at laboratory scale. And here you see on the one hand side, the uh, machine set that is currently being fabricated. You see the runners on the right hand side and the, uh, the setup for uh, pumping and turbining through a pipe. And on the other hand, we have already started and worked on stress in fish, making sure that the fish is not if, if affected by large flow velocities in the inlet uh, section of the machine. Next, the question, the big question was where are potential sites for building such a ring dam? And while you see on the right hand side, you see a map and uh, some different locations and areas, we needed to come up with a site assessment methodology um, that is in integrating a lot of different criteria. Um, we have also worked on designs and you see the lower right bottom picture uh, where a potential cross section for that ring, ring dike is uh, illustrated. And we also needed, and that I think was also a crucial part, needed to engage with stakeholders and with the broader society in order to already start um, communicating and bringing across um, the message and the information about that new technology. Last, maybe the most important one in terms of 
effect um, is to understand how such a storage system is helping serving the grid. And uh, we have, for that, we have worked on a grid side controller design and analysis and, and analyzing the effects on the grid stability and the flexibility. And just as one picture you see here, the 50 Hertz and the spikes that occurred in some of the times of the grid. So what is the status? And that's my last slide. We have uh, successfully designed uh, devices, machine sets. We have assessed which sites are potentially feasible. Now we are in the various designs and construction and planning activities. And I can say as a summary that Alfeos, which is now in its final year, in its harvest year, is now integrating all the different results up to a pre-feasibility level in order to get ready for an implementation of that new and exciting technology. And with that, I may want to hand back to Stuart um, and thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Niels, for that comprehensive introduction. You made it very uh, engaging and visual. Uh, you're touching on the main points of the financial aspects, the environmental, technical, and legal that we'll get into with our with our panelists uh, shortly. But before that, a tour de force of how Alpheus technology is a game changer by Jeremy Bricker. Thank you, Stuart. Here, uh, I will discuss how Alpheus, what Alpheus brings in that is new and what it builds on. <clears throat> so as Professor Gosberg said, presently, uh, reversible pump turbines are quite efficient at high heads, such as this um, Francis runner on the left. At, in large plants, they can operate at greater, greater than 80% efficiency in each mode, pumping and turbining, leading to round trip efficiencies um, within the 70s or 80s uh, percent. However, at low heads, for example, you can see this bulb turbine on the right. Um, at low heads, meaning uh, traditionally heads less than 20 meters, <clears throat> Uh, reversible pump turbine technology is not yet well developed. <clears throat> um, bulb turbines can also pump, but efficiencies are usually um, around 60%. So in Alpheus, we have this challenge of developing a reversible pump turbine um, at low head. We're using um, drawing on technology from the um, ship prop industry using the um, idea of a counter rotating reversible pump turbine, which <clears throat> shown here uh, with the generators inside a bulb has this blue and this red uh, runner, which have concentric shafts and up and rotate in opposite directions in order to um, extract um, extra curl from the flow or extra circulation from the flow and um, withdraw or impart uh, enhanced energy to the flow. This is what's leading to higher efficiency. So we've, we've drawn expertise from the um, boat prop industry uh, for this design. On the electrical side, <clears throat> we're drawing on expertise from the wind turbine industry and the electric vehicle industry uh, so University of Kent is developing an axial flux permanent magnet, permanent magnet synchronous machine um, for this reversible pump turbine um, that allows a higher efficiency in a lower um, longitudinal dimension for um, this the electrical component of the machine, allowing therefore a higher efficiency in total. Mm -hmm. The other industries that we draw on for the civil part of the project are the marine offshore and dredging industries. So Alpheus brings in a new application 
for these industries. On the left here, you see a, a floating dry dock for caisson construction. Caissons are one of the integral components of the conceptual design of the, the ring dam that Professor Grossberg spoke about, as well as the power plant, the um, reversible pump turbine will be embedded within. And on the right, you see a, a dredger, which would be necessary to complete the embankments uh, that go together with the caissons. So we draw upon um, very mature, well-developed industries for construction of this project and give them a new uh, application to do so. So that is, thank you, Stuart. That is all for my presentation. Thank you, Jeremy. Thank you very much for that. Um, Anne Overmeyer, can you please give us some insights into your work on this project and uh, some views on the lifetime sustainability of what you guys are working on? Uh, yes, thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to uh, be a speaker here. Um, so as Blue Cluster, we are, uh, we are in the advisory board of this really exciting project. And the Blue Cluster is indeed a Flemish, a Belgian uh, cluster organization. Um, we have uh, about 200 members and 90% of them are from industry. All industries working on, on the blue economy where for instance, offshore wind is one, uh, one of the major uh, uh, domains uh, that we work in. Maybe you know some of our members are really quite famous, I think. Uh, you may, may know Demi, Jan de Nul, Parkwind, uh, Tractorbell from the NG Group, and so on. That's our, probably the most known companies in the cluster. And uh, some years ago, there have been plans in the Belgian North Sea to construct uh, an artificial island uh, with pumped hydro. Um, at that point, it, it, it was not feasible economically. So that's why this project is really key because it was one of the things why the island was never, never uh, realized. Um, another point is public accept acceptance, where we also touch upon. Uh, in this project. Now, um, since uh, a couple of months, uh, there is a new plan for an energy island in the Belgian North Sea, and this time it will be uh, realized. It is uh, much further in the sea. It will not be seen from the shore. Um, <clears throat> and mm -hmm. uh, it is rather traditional. Uh, and that's, as blue cluster, we are an innovation cluster. Um, and we regret that. Uh, currently, the island is is, uh, is constipated as, as just an uh, energy knot. It's, it's where all the energy from the offshore wind farms, the new offshore wind farms will be combined and sent to the shore. And there will be also an interconnector with the UK and with Denmark and probably also with other countries in the North Sea. But so far, nothing has been foreseen uh, with regard to energy storage or with regard to what will we do with the stability. And that's, uh, that will certainly be necessary. Uh, so for the, we will have to look further into solutions for that. And so pumped hydro is still uh, one of the options besides maybe battery storage and also uh, hydrogen, uh, the production and the storage of, uh, of hydrogen. So, it, it will be key in this project to look at those different solutions and how they could tap into each other and how, where, what technology could be the best to, uh, to use. Um, and also um, we could tap this work and some other work we have been doing over the last years with regard to co-design of large marine and uh, artificial structures. Uh, such as islands, where we intend to combine several uh, several uses, several functions like energy storage, but also energy production, for instance, uh, from floating PV or um, marine aquaculture or just nature creation. So really keen on on, on you know looking at further collaboration. And, and innovation, but also in, uh, in implementation of this uh, technology. 
I don't know if this is a... Uh... Okay. Thanks very much, Anne, for that uh, uh, first intro. We're going to come back to some of the questions you you uh, solicited in my mind about the energy islands and the co-design. So I'll be back. Um, in the meantime, uh, Dr. Peter Hoffman from, uh, from Tenet, if you could... Um, uh, say a few words about the energy storage angle and the grid load stabilization um, and the, the basic work that you're doing to advance the energy transition here, please. Yeah, thank you, Stuart, and uh, welcome to all that which are listening to this panel. Uh, I have prepared one slide. Can you show it? Uh, the point is, you all know about the Green Deal. Uh, Europe wants to be climate neutral in 2050. And that would mean that all the conventional power plants will stop operation and we will mainly base our system on, on wind and solar. And um, the, we have some regions in Europe, and one is in my own uh, Senate, in my own control area, it's Schleswig-Holstein in, in Germany, mm -hmm. where we already have more or less this, uh, this system states that we have a, a big surplus of wind uh, in the system, a bit solar, and and uh, let's say no conventional plants. Stuart, can you make it, or should I try to share? Uh, you please go ahead and share. I can try. Moment. Yeah. Um, then I have to find the right button. Bildschirm freigeben. Moment. So, do you see something? Yeah. Yes. Oh, that's great. Looks good. Maybe Looks I can even, even increase it a bit. Yeah, now. So right. um, you see here, this is typical for other, uh, for, it's a picture from, or the measurement from this year, also from last year, uh, summer 2022. And you see here that there is some, the green line is the solar in feed. Uh, it's clear it's uh, not during the night, only during the day, some sunny days here. And we have also some wind in feed. This is a blue line. And then we have some load in the territory. And the difference between the in feed and the load is a residual load. And this is this orange line. That would mean here with, with snow, uh, also in the beginning here, the first hours of this picture, I know it's clear if you see my mouse. Uh, it is, uh, we have in the night no solar, it was also a, a very low wind in feed, and therefore the load in this area needs to be imported to Schleswig-Holstein. But there are other uh, times, for example, in, in during uh, lunchtime of the next day, where we have nice solar in feed and also strong wind in feed, and you see here now the residual load is negative, so Schleswig-Holstein is exporting way much more than their, their normal load. So they're, they're a real surplus. And uh, especially what this is area which are highlighted here on the 6th and 7th of June, we have extreme wind, although very strong wind, good solar uh, in feed, and you see uh, a, a huge overshooting of electricity in these areas compared with other times, you see them on the graph where we have a deficit. And I think this is a typical picture of the future we will see for whole Europe uh, when we are coming to our uh, green energy future. And what is needed? Um, there are four points. One thing is you might know about this uh, rotating machines, which giving some inertia into the system, which stabilizes the system at all. If we all lose the conventional power plant, then we are, have only an inverter-based infeed, and then we have a lack of inertia, and this it gives a lot of concerns uh, to, to system operation. Can we run the system still stable? Is not too weak uh, that uh, an imbalance will cause directly a blackout, etc. So inertia is crucial to have a stabilized system. Mm -hmm. Second thing is, uh, the energy storage part, it was already mentioned. So the only thing, we, uh, the chance we have here in Schleswig-Holstein export that or import energy if there is an imbalance. It would be much better if we have storages available uh, so that we can have a kind of time shift of the surplus into a storage and later on, some hours later, some days later, we can use the same energy to, to cover the deficits we have. 
So energy storage is also really crucial in a system when we go for renewables. Third topic, I should, I should pop some more, yeah. Um, so this is the, this is the energy balance. Nevertheless, we, we see um, imbalances still um, between infeed and load. And this needs control power. It's a typical ancillary services that TSOs need to balance the system out in real time. And so therefore, we need some sources who can deliver frequency control reserve, automatic frequency reserve, or restoration reserves. These are technical terms for those of you which are a bit longer in the market called before primary, secondary, and, and tertiary control reserve. These are the basic ancillary services we need to buy as a TSO to balance the system out in real time. And the last thing is uh, dispatchable flex. Um, we sometimes see that we have overloads. Also, for example, when we have to export here a lot of energy and our transmission lines are not strong enough, then we have to intervene into the dispatch of the power plants. Then we have to curtail wind, for example, or and start up gas turbines behind the congestion. And it would be perfect uh, if we have also here a, a, a generation like this uh, pump storage that we can have stop production or start production that we can also alleviate uh, conditions we might have in the grid. So these are the needs of, of, of an energy system from, from the view of the transmission system operator and from the market. And we need some sources who can deliver this. Also this very steep ramping. You see here these huge ramps that in, in minutes time, in 10 minutes time, we need to have additional 100, 200 megawatts available. And you heard before from Professor Guseberg that these pump hydro storages are the perfect match to all of these needs. So they can deliver inertia because they have rotating mass. They, they are storages. They can sell all kinds of ancillary services. And they are always very flexible to be on our demand, can start or stop production very quickly. So that's why pump hydro is a perfect match uh, to the renewable future. And the problem also addressed already by Niels Groseberg is that unfortunately in flat areas like in the coastline of the Netherlands and Schleswig-Holstein, we have no natural resources for pump hydro. The only chance we have is to build cables to Scandinavia or connection to the Alps to get access to pump hydro. And with this new technology of Alpheus, there is maybe a chance to have on site close to the surplus of wind also the possibility of pump hydro storages and that's why i'm really also in in in, in the byrat in the in the board here to visit the development and i have some hopes that this uh, in in a couple of time will materialize in real pump hydros in shallow water thank you Thank you, Peter, for that positive and, and encouraging, enthusiastic message, um, which is somewhat contagious. Uh, the, the perfect match for the energy transition sounds very good, and it's a great headline for the for the news. Now, when we get down to the to the nitty gritty, uh, Madame Bettina Geisler, there are some realities and some basic challenges out there, legal and other, that we're confronted with. So walk us through how, how one would even start to go about this. Thank you, Stuart. First of all, on behalf of the external advisory board, where I'm the chairperson, I would like to express a warm welcome uh, to all our guests. Um, on behalf uh, as well of my colleagues, Anne and Peter, who are with me on the panel, and three of us, uh, Antoine, uh, Monsieur Gérard, and Pierre Agresti, are among our guests. So a very warm welcome. Uh, I'm very proud to be with you and to discuss with you the challenges and the opportunities. Regarding your question, Stuart, my first answer is the typical answer, or which is considered to be the typical answer of a lawyer, it depends. <laughs> and of course, you will not be satisfied. Thus, I will go into a bit more into details. 
Yes. The permitting process and the legal environment is part of the administrative law and that varies from state to state. Netherlands has another administrative law than Germany and Germany another than Denmark. Thus, the first question is, where is the location in which state or to which uh, adjacent to which state is the plant constructed is it the coastal line of the netherlands is it the coastal line of denmark of germany and once you have identified the state you must ask is it the coastal line or is it still between the zone which is considered to be the territorial sea which means up to 12 nautic miles or even in a further and far development perhaps as it has been the development for wind offshore plants far away in the so-called exclusive economic zone and all these territories are governed by different legal provision depending on the state to which coast they are attached. Thus, first question, which state law? German, Netherlands, Denmark. Second point, you will need a construction permit, roughly spoken, because I don't want to go into details, but you need a construction permit. And afterwards, most probably an operation permit or even as it is hydro generation, a sort of concession that is for the moment not yet clear. That's from the process point of view. Content wise, you can say, and to my experience, this is more or less the same in all the states I have investigated. The crucial point is the environmental impact. This means you will be granted a permit if this plant and the construction of the plant does not endanger the maritime environment. And this environment can be pollution, this environment can be animals, which might be disturbed by the construction noise. That can be existing cables to wind offshore plants, radio waves for military purposes, shipping routes if the plant is a bit uh, away from the coast. And then, of course, from the technology point of view because we are talking of hydropower fish mortality and all these uh, considerations are part of the environmental impact possible impact and part i would say the major part of the permitting process will be an environmental impact assessment mm -hmm. And this study you have to give to the authority. And if you can prove that this plant does not endanger the environmental maritime environment, you will be granted a permit. There are some exceptions where you have to pay attention. These are these Natura 2000 uh, natural reserves resulting from EU directives or, for example, under German state law, natural reserves, where it will be very hard to build such a plant. But the overall impact or the overall question is really which sort of environmental impact will it have? Will it dramatically change the environment mm -hmm. and that that will be the crucial questions and the next point but we can discuss it later is what Anne mentioned the acceptance and if you remember 
uh, wind offshore plants when they were near to the coast had in a first step rather low acceptance. I think our plant will have much more acceptance and this will be a very positive aspect. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bettina. Um, so building on what you said about the environmental assessments, which are key component here to gaining potential social acceptance and so on, um, can uh, Jeremy and or another panelist give us some insights into what uh, studies or precautions or uh, efforts you've made to look at this uh, environmental implications of um, of placing these pumped hydro power dams? Yes, certainly. So the primary environmental impact that we are considering in this project is the effect on fish. And within this project, we have developed two different reversible pump turbine technologies. The one that I have shown, which is a counter-rotating propeller, um, which is not fish friendly. Um, and therefore we have done a large study about how fish screens um, will affect efficiency and also affect the health of fish themselves. We've also developed a more fish friendly um, positive displacement reversible pump turbine that is larger and has a slower rotational frequency um, and larger space between lobes in order to allow fish to swim through with less uh, mortality, um, but that device also has a lower efficiency. So what we are um, focusing on at this stage is the counter-rotating device <clears throat> um, with design of fish screens that are placed far away enough from the pump turbine inlet such that flow velocities are below 20 to 50 centimeters a second and we are doing um, field studies uh, together with the University of Tushia about mm -hmm. to, to, to measure the stress induced, um, the stress experienced by fishes by measuring uh, cortisol levels in fishes um, as a function of flow speeds they are exposed to in front of, in front of fish screens in order to know how how um, far away from the inlet to place fish screens at a low enough velocity, fish do not experience sufficient stress. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks for that. So does anyone else on the panel want, want to add to that? If not, um, Niels, if, if you don't mind uh, resharing your screen to show the location of these, um, Pumped hydro dams because there, there are two or three interrelated questions from the attendees asking about the location. Can they be uh, artificial lakes, inland artificial islands, or do they have to, uh, or, or can they be in freshwater and lakes, or do they have to rely on the, on the tidal energy of, of oceans? So yeah. sorry to go back to the beginning, but I think people joined a little bit afterwards. So just re-explain uh, that basic model. Yeah, I think that's fine. Um, I'll probably not share the slide because that was more of a conceptual slide. That was not the final few pilot sites that we have identified. Uh, but in terms of the concept and the siting, I can definitely answer uh, to the questions. So first of all, that, that ring them and you have seen that we have have done a preliminary designs with five kilometer in diameter <laughs> these could be sited uh, in principle throughout the the north sea for example um, in order to come up with a a final assessment we had to do um, a multi-criteria assessment so for example we had to take into consideration uh, shipping lanes um, typical military exercise areas or areas where already pipelines or cables are in and so forth. So you come up with a list of a lot of criteria and then based on the overlap of these criteria, you can exclude or include actively areas where you could build this ring dam. And, and that's in principle how that is done. And I have 
uh, intentionally not brought the final pilot uh, site map because I, I didn't want that to overlay our general description of the technology and rather talk about the technology versus um, this site is not good versus the other site is better or worse. Um, the other question I think was about uh, uh, integrating additional purposes. Like the, I think I saw one of the questions with mangroves or other things. Um, in principle, if we are not looking into the North Sea, uh, but into um, equatorial regions, um, this could definitely be an option. Um, Nature-based solutions is here a, a keyword um, that is often meant. Or if we want to look into um, ecosystems or habitats that we have more in, in, in European waters, um, mm -hmm. I think, yes, that could be an option, one that is in addition to the main purpose, but they would need further research. We have not actively looked into, uh, say, doing things with the beaches or with the dike, dike geometry by itself. But, but this is, I think, an excellent, excellent um, input from, from that participant. Okay, and as a follow-up to that, there's, there's a question related to whether the concept can be exported to emerging markets in Africa, Middle East, Latin America, Asia. Does your model specifically have to be shallow seas and coastal areas, I think is, is the related implication there. Um, is that also for me or for someone else in the panel? Whoever wants to jump in. I, I could address that. Um, there, the model is just technical, so there there is no um, requirement that it be in the North Sea. Um, temperature is, um, I mean, if we we're in tropical areas, temperature would be more of an issue. Um, but that's not that doesn't affect what we are doing. Um, whether it has to be in a sea at all, that's also um, not required. It, it could be in a lake. Um, it could be on uh, flat land on on plains as long as there's a water supply to create an inner and outer basin. Um, so it's it's quite flexible. the 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 development is that it 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 extends um, a high efficiency reversible pump turbine down to heads at which one hadn't existed previously. Um, and so any application that requires it um, a low head for pumped hydro storage can be made feasible using this technology. Okay, thanks for that. And th there's a, a couple of technical questions that, that we should um, also try to answer from our from our from our guests. Uh, which what are the flow head characteristics of the counter rotating pumps turbines, and what's the velocity? Uh, the ro the rotational speed I don't quite remember, but I believe it's in the high hundreds, uh, eight or nine hundred RPM. Um, I know that um, the design does not use a gearbox. Um, it gets to um, um, the required speed um, just via, via the number of poles. Um, it's also meant to be uh, variable speed. Mm -hmm. um, and use power electronics to interface with the uh, with the grid. Um, variable speed allows it to retain a, a high efficiency at uh, a range of heads because it's it's being developed for um, you know, primarily uh, five to fifteen meters of head, but to extend to two to twenty meters. Um, and uh, that to re to retain high efficiency at such a large range of heads. Um, requires a uh, each of the two uh, runners or impellers to be able to um, control its speed independently. Okay, thank you for that. Um, shifting a little bit over to the financial side of things, the business model, the the return on investment, the market pricing, um, and you mentioned the energy islands as as a model. Um, is this a model that can be replicated or are there things that need to be adjusted? How can, how can we square this circle so that it's commercially viable? Um, 
Yes, I think this is a model, huh? uh, not currently for this, for this, the current energy island which will be constructed in the Belgian North Sea <clears throat> is due to be built uh, in the coming two years. So we're, we're kind of too late with this uh, uh, novel technology, I think, to implement it in this uh, current island as it is. <clears throat> And I think certainly in Belgium that is, uh, the authorities uh, are willing to look further into other other options. Um, as, as I said, uh, the, the, we don't have a, a large space. Maybe we could collaborate with the Netherlands uh, for this. That would be ideal. I think we're very close to each other. We do have wind farms who are adjacent uh, to each other back to back. Um, so it could be a, a fantastic uh, opportunity to coll for collab collaboration, and I think that the uh, it, there is a, a, a possibility that the business case would be possible if uh, of positive um, if we look at integration, as I said, with other other uses, um, mm -hmm. which would make and of course also if we see that the um, efficiency is much higher than before. That would already be a big step. Eh? Um, and then uh, I think maybe in the combination with other uses, that would be worthwhile uh, to uh, explore further and further research. Uh, if that would be a would be a, a, a potential. Uh, there okay. is a new marine spatial plan coming up in Belgium. We have uh, we have every six years we have an we have an update of the marine spatial plan. Current plan is running until uh, 2026, but um, as of, as we speak, the next month, the the negotiations and the discussions on the update of the marine spatial plan will be started, and the attention of our minister of the North Sea is to land with that to have already a blueprint ready by the next elections uh, in Belgium, which will be in 2024, so within one year. Mm -hmm. So now is the time, I think, to come up with new ideas, put them on the table and see uh, what's possible. In particular, if we can also uh, start already now uh, to raise public awareness and acceptance because that was also an issue last time. You, ju you just cannot, out of the blue, uh, start a start construction, the construction of an island in front of the coast. <laughs> it's uh, not possible. You really have to engage with the community, and uh, that's also something you should start early on. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you for that. We're, I'm going to loop in Bettina for the social acceptance in a minute. But before that, um, Peter, could we follow up on the grid integration of what Anne alluded to and the market pricing and how to optimize energy storage? That beautiful graph that you showed, how does this become reality and how do you, can you explain that to us? Now, well, let's say, I, as I said, this is already reality for the territory of Schleswig-Holstein, and I assume that this will be the reality of whole Europe in a couple of years, minimally till 2045, 2050. Mm -hmm. And uh, what we currently see is that due to this yeah, shutdown of conventional power plants, the prices are heavily increased. You, we all suffer the last winter in Europe of, of high prices. Um, uh, because we need alternatives uh, in, in cases there is no sun and there is no wind, then it will be very expensive to, to continue due to the CO2 costs and, and the environmental impact. If we still have a, um, a power plant available burning coal, it will be too expensive. So the point is that currently the prices are going up and those who need to earn money with ancillary services, with storages, they make good money with it. So uh, a couple of years ago, this was not the case, but this the wheel turns. Also, let's say now uh, these pump hydro, they are also sinking. For example, in um, close to Nuremberg, there is an, an, an old uh, pump storage plant which was stopped uh, ten years ago, 
because uh, it needs refurbishment uh, for, of the upper lake, which is very costly. And, and, and E.ON, I think, was the owner of this. They said that it makes no, no sense because you couldn't earn money. And suddenly, now they want to, 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 to renew it and, and to take it back in operation. So this is a new hype that uh, with these high prices, we currently see pump storage is really getting interesting and can finance now higher investments than in, uh, let's say, five years ago. Okay. Um, for the energy storage access, can it be linked to hydrogen in some way? And if not, what's the optimal balance for the whole energy storage angle of this? Um, yeah, let's say we have to distinguish between short-term storages, maybe day storages, and here a perfect match are the batteries, I would say. They are comparable sheep, comparable sheep compared to, to pump hydro, and they can fulfill this role in a good manner. And we have hydrogen but with a very very low efficiency so when we really want to use hydrogen as seasonal storage uh, then we have efficiency loss of 60 to 70 percent so uh, but nevertheless we will not build a pump hydro who stores the energy in summer and and, and give it back in winter or other way around that will also not can finance this pump hydro so i see pump hydro somewhere in the middle between the batteries for the short-term storages and let's say daily to weekly storages for the cycle of, of this pump hydro. This is a, the perfect match for pump hydro. For the long-term seasonal storages, unfortunately or fortunately, the, uh, we have to have to look for other options. And here hydrogen comes in, even if it is low efficiency, but this is for me the, the only option we have right now for, for seasonal storages. Okay, super, thank you very much. Um, there was a, another question related to the trade-offs between fresh water and salt water, perhaps going to, to Jeremy. Um, is there an effect on the turbines themselves, was the question from our audience. Yes, definitely. So salt water, as you all know, is quite corrosive. Um, therefore, our project has been drawing on experience um that edf has had operating the rans tidal plant and um that's documented from okinawa in japan uh from the yanbaru um, seawater pumped hydro station in each mm -hmm. of these cases the um the metal metal components that are in contact with um seawater are made from stainless steel um plus they are painted and use active cathodic protection so those are all um being um, implemented in our designs. Um, again, drawing on especially that RANS um, experience. Um, at Yanbaru, they also used, instead of steel pen stocks, they used um, CFRP carbon fiber reinforced polymer for the, or plastic pen stocks. Um, in our project, since this is um, an axial, uh, flow turbine that's in a submerged water conduit the whole way, we expect the uh, conduit to be um, concrete. Uh, therefore, that um, is going to experience less uh, corrosion issues than the turbine itself, which is, yeah, as I said, stainless steel painting and active cathodic protection. Okay, super. I hope that answered the question for our, for our audience. Um, I want to spend the last few minutes on the social acceptance angle, which is very important. Um, Bettina, can you please uh, give us some of your experience in this? Yeah, um, first of all, I would like to answer one question in the chat, uh, which relates to do we need to prioritize um, nature protection aspects versus climate change? Um, mm -hmm possibilities to fight against climate change, it might be well possible that at a certain moment, uh, the legislator will prioritize and then uh, adapt uh, legal provisions to these questions. Regarding your question, social acceptance, this is of course extremely important. And I give you a good example from a pumps from a projected. It came never into construction operation from a projected 
pump hydro uh, power plant in the southwestern part of Germany in the Black Forest. It was the Atov project of Schluchseewerke. And I think they were extremely well organized. Uh, they had round table um, discussions with the um, mayors of the communities affected, with the people, with the um, owners of the properties affected. And if we speak of an offshore plant uh, such as ours, um, you probably will have all the um, villages and cities and the inhabitants living on the coast, which might be uh, affected or which consider themselves to be disturbed by noise, by the free view on the sea. And this is important to integrate their interest already at a very early moment. I mean, once it may be that the legislator takes a decision how to weight these interests and how to balance these interests, but from a project point of view, I think it's extremely important that you integrate these people that you welcome them, that you perhaps organize roundtable discussions in order to explain it to the people. And then you have a much higher political acceptance than if you wouldn't do that. Yes, and, and this goes back to Anne's point about co-design and bringing these different stakeholders together that don't usually have a tendency to interact, whether it's the local group and technical scientists or politicians. Um, is This is something that Blau Cluster advances and it's something that you're, you're, you're clearly seeing on the horizon with the Belgian elections coming around the corner and you're seeing the, the maritime spatial plan. So I feel like you have a good view on, on how this could roll out. Yes, indeed, this is a, a point of attention for us, as, uh, as we also have in Belgium already some negative examples. We know we have to start early and uh, go in, in discussion with the local communities. Um, so our members, um, we, one of our members uh, who has experience with, in the, with uh, stakeholder engagement, it's, a, it's an organization called uh, ORC. They, um, they have lead, led a project, a blue cluster project, to design a, a tool set uh, for this interaction with the public. So we, we, this is ready. This project has been delivered and, and could be applied to, to any one of, of these ideas that we have here um, in order to you know, ha have the public engaged in how they would like that the structure would look like, um, what kind of uh, functions it would have, besides, of course, the the, the energy storage uh, function, so that it would um, also have a benefit for them. Eh? As I as I uh, already mentioned, possibilities like marine aquaculture. Eh? We we do, for instance, in Belgium have a strong interest in cultivation of oysters. Uh, mussels and seaweed, and, and that might help to get the whole thing accepted. If there would be local farmers, local sea farmers involved, having a little business over there and, and, and having a profit, and that, that could be a, con a very concrete example. It, it wouldn't have to be like that, but that's an example. Um, also nature, we see also since Corona, since the Corona crisis that uh, uh, the nature is very important for the people. They want to uh, uh, preserve nature. They want to um, spend more time uh, in nature. And that could also be an additional function that you would give to the island, uh, especially as we also have mentioned some, one of the um, participants here mentioned, could we include nature-based solutions 
uh, could we design the island uh, that it looks more natural that's, uh, and that it can also have a, a nature function, that could also be a possibility that would maybe um, be beneficial to have a better public acceptance uh, for it. So, but of course, uh, it, there, there is the need for, for energy storage as a basic need. We will need that looking at how much offshore wind energy will be installed in the North Sea in the coming, say, uh, 10, 10 to 20 years. It will be absolutely necessary that we further think of, of these solutions. Great, thank you so much, Dan. Um, we have uh, one more technical question from the audience, but I, I think that I will ask them to follow up with the organizers for the purpose of time and because it's quite specific. Um, and I like to end things on a, on a good note, which is the, the positive one that Anne was sending. Um, I invite everyone that's, that's joined us today to visit the website alpheus-h2020.eu. This is an exciting uh, EU-funded project. I learned a lot of new things with this, uh, with this panel, so thank you for including Revolve that I represent today. Um, and thank you to the panelists for taking the time. I wish you all a good day. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Yes, bye -bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Have a nice day.